بسم الله السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام This is the first time I've ever done the countdown. <laughs> yeah, fifty-two, fifty-two so. episodes later, I've decided to do the countdown. <laughs> How is everybody? Hope you're all fine. Inshallah. Hello, Amin. How are you? Alhamdulillah. Good. Good. I've got my uh, homemade. Uh, I call it karak, like you know, spiced tea. Karak chai. Yes. Uh, but I don't know if this is the legit way to make it. It's just um, tea with uh, cardamom and cloves and sugar, and then add a load of milk, and that's it, really. Mm. Yeah. Tastes about about right to me, to be honest. So I should but become you know, more into uh, tea and stuff. I don't really drink much. Why should you? Because I want to. Uh, I want to assimilate with the culture. Okay, <laughs> <of> tea drinkers. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, here's a, here's a weird one though. Why is it that I've never heard of iced karak? Is that a thing? I've only heard of karak this year. Okay, uh, but I mean over here it's like a big deal, like not a big deal, but it's very common. Okay, everyone drinks karak, and it's like cheap, and it's like you know everyone's just drinking karak all day. So why is nobody put it in a can and sold the iced version? Is it is it disgusting or something? How about you try it out? Have you got some with you right now? Well, that's what I'm going to do. I've got the rest of the, this stuff. I'm going to chill it and taste it. Go on, then. You do that, and then um, we'll do a little business. Yeah. A little, little business, me and you. Business, a little yeah. mind heist refreshments. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then boom, boom, bada bing. <laughs> yes. No more. We're out here, baby. <laughs> no more emergency <laughs> services job. <laughs> Bro, tell me about it. <laughs> oh, oh. What's the latest? What's new? Uh, apart what's from business? apart from that, I mean, unless there's anything notable, anything Not else? Really? Um, I finished uh, Stillness is the Key last week. I was going to say yeah, because I on my uh, drive home, yes. I listened to your review hey, on, YouTube. on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, I so, saw. Hey, that's I mean, he's doing a review of a book that I'm currently reading. Mm. Let me press play, <laughs> and, uh, and I enjoyed spoiler. your review, bro. I enjoyed your review. Yeah, yeah. It's a good book, bro. It's pretty good. It's it's good, actually. What, what do you think about books like that, which are, they're like more like just giving you these little ideas, little prompts, rather than you need to do step one, do this, step two, do that, step three, do that? I much prefer it this way than, okay. than a, like a like a step-by-step guide to achieve a certain goal. I don't mm. like that. I prefer, I prefer ideas and anecdotes, yeah. and then I can... You know, use elements of that to to you know implement and inject into my own lifestyle, mm. as opposed. And the main reason being is because I can't like if it was a, if stillness as a key was a step by step guide, mm. then I would have put it down because I wouldn't be able to relate to any of the examples given. Right. Um, because I even struggle now with the books from Ryan Holiday specifically, is because a lot of his examples are just people that I don't really never really looked up to like you mentioned for example winston churchill like mm. the moment you start talking to me about winston churchill's routine like i don't really care oh. <laughs> do you know what i mean yeah because it, that's not the sort of person i want to try and be mm. like as muslims as well role models at least you know as a practicing muslim or a conscious muslim or role models are always going to be the sahaba the, the prophets mm. um so like you tell me what so and so's done or some next guy has done and as far as i can appreciate the gr- the success they've had in the dunya I won't really look up to them the same way that mm. maybe a non-Muslim will look up to them and want to be like them, you know? Okay. I need to keep that in mind, inshallah. Uh, I, I, yeah, I agree, actually. It's like, yeah, just give people ideas, inspiration here and there. Give them examples so that if that example happens to fit into their life, they can take that, but then otherwise leave it a little bit open. And then yeah. you could even, if you want, like you could make some kind of, uh, extra chapter where it's like implementation kind of thing very detailed step by step but then yeah. that's only for certain people kind of thing hmm interesting i think i always i fear step by step guides only because i just i just worry that like no no one's life is the same as someone else's do you know what i mean yeah so i'm just like i can't i can't even start to consume it that's why i think i probably dropped out of atomic habits because that was a bit more instructional and i was just mm. like i don't think i can follow through with this so mm. i haven't finished it but i'll head back to it mm. but the problem is i keep forgetting to cancel my audible subscription <laughs> so 
it gave me another credit yesterday and yeah. I was like oh, or the day before and I was like oh god I forgot to flip in cancel it mm. so I ended up getting another book and it's just yeah. god I'm treating these audiobooks like video games bro <laughs> one after another yeah I mean you know the, the good thing with Amazon is they're very good customer service so you could you like now you've paid for the credit if you just go on there if you call them or go in their chat they'll refund it to you literally with no questions asked or what you could do is you can pause it so you can pause it or you can uh, sometimes when you want to cancel then it will offer you two pounds a month instead for three months yeah. or something like that so yeah. they're, they're pretty good like that but um, I paused a, a few months ago. I paused for three months, so I wasn't paying anything. I wasn't really. I think it was when I was in the UK and I didn't have any real time when I was able to listen to audiobooks. But now I'm back here. I'm more able. I'm actually, as I said in the video in the review of the book, I'm spending 20 minutes every morning listening to an audiobook. So I'm going to go through these quick. So therefore, now is a good time, you know. Um, and uh, I'm I'm nearly I'm probably I've got about a third of a, a book left a very interesting book bro but actually before we get into that you know Winston Churchill yeah just because yeah. we mentioned him um, so how about this kind of theory of World War Two and I, this is like a it, it's not what I was taught uh, going to like a, a British curriculum school you study World War One World War Two a lot right. And, of course, it's always assumed that the Germans or the Nazis or whatever are the, the absolute evil ones in this war, right? Now, right. I don't deny that, obviously, they, they did terrible things. But the way I actually view World War II more now is it's like it's not good versus evil. And that's how it was always framed to me in school. It's not so much good versus evil. It's more like... Um, Germany's agenda, which included doing evil things, versus other countries' agendas and, and power struggle, which also included terrible things. So it was it was more like a nationalistic war, I would say, bro. Um, yeah. Obviously, th in order to give your troops morale and to, to boost their motivation, you would say that you're fighting against pure evil here. But the truth is... You know, a lot of the Germans, I'm sure, they were not fighting for the ideology of Nazism. They were just fighting for their nation, if you like. And vice versa for the French, for whoever was fighting. It's like, yeah, you need to defend your country kind of thing. So it's like Germany's invading Poland. So now, of course, the Polish are going to rally together to defend themselves. It's not so much maybe that they hated fascism even. It's just that they didn't want their country invaded. So Definitely. and that actually helps us as Muslims, you know, swallow the pill of the Ottoman Empire uh, joining up with Germany in World War One, um, because you might think, oh, how could they do that? Germany was absolute evil. Well, I mean, it was just a power struggle. Maybe, you know, historians are going to destroy me over this, but this is what I, I think. I don't know. How could you say that? How dare you have an opinion on a podcast? I mean. Goodness <laughs> sakes. <laughs> I mean, I'm quite aware of my kind of uh, ignorance on the topic, but I'm just putting it out there, bro, because, you know, life is not about just pure evil and pure good. Like, especially we know, Yanni, how can, how can Western Europe just, let me think, actually, during World War II, Western Europe was very, very, very much still a colonizer. I mean, uh, Obviously, uh, Algeria got independence in, in 1962, and that kind of kicked off a lot of France being forced to let go of other colonies in West Africa, etc. Um, Britain gave independence to India and by extension like Pakistan and Bangladesh. I think, is it 1972 or seven, something like it, No, 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 maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's 46. Either way, when World War II started, they were still colonizing half the world, right? So it's not like they're the most just and more moral people on, on the planet. It's not like yeah. we would assume that they, you know, they entered World War II purely for moral reasons. I mean, come on. From the good of their hearts and souls, bro. <clears throat> I'm sure some people were like that, but probably not the majority even, when we talk about the people actually calling the shots. Yeah. Have you heard of it's... Dresden, bro? No, what's that? Um, it's a city in Germany where the uh, 
the British, um, maybe the French, maybe the Americans were helping, I'm not sure. They bombed the heck out of this city with fire bombs to the level where they pretty much incinerated the whole city. Oh, and, wow. they, and they used like fire bombs. So it's like it just burned the whole place down. And uh, I think that's like one example of the, these, uh, the, the, that side of the war just uh, doing things, taking things too far, you know. And obviously the obvious example is, is uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki as well. Mm, definitely. Okay, bro. So, you know, this, uh, this book, I'm, I'm nearly, I'm getting towards the end of it now. It's very interesting. It's, it's called The Coddling of the American Mind. Okay. Ooh, so okay. coddling, of course, is like, uh, you know, ba- babying or like, uh, you know, wrapping it up tight and keeping it safe from absolutely everything like you do with a baby. And yeah. um, it's very interesting. It, it kind of focuses a lot on, on American dynamics, but I think it's the case as well in other Western universities, especially universities. And it's basically about the way that they, they, they call it Generation Z, right? Generation Z, they defined as anyone born after 1994, yeah? And yeah. basically, it's like this generation, they have very distinct um, traits, okay? For example, um, mental health illnesses are very high amongst this generation, and they're very... Uh, weak, you could say. They're very prone to easily be hurt, whether that's emotionally, um, they physically, they, they're not used to the rough and tumble play that other people grew up with pre- before them. Um, and more and more, they are uh, going into universities and they're considering uh, any offensive speech or any speech that upsets them to be harmful, Right, and he he they focus a lot on this dif- the difference between feeling discomfort or being upset from something and actually being harmed by it, and this this generation they've actually been taught to conflate the two and mix the two, and that's why you start especially in the extreme size of things in in the U.S. you start hearing people saying that that speech is violence, right? Speech harms me. Speech is violence. It's like a whole brand new definition of what harm actually is or violence actually is. Like never was it. Defy, it was always physical harm and so they're not really doing it from the point of view of like this generation sucks or whatever it's just very interesting how um the psychology of a whole generation was shaped from so many different things you know uh, he talks about and and the, the, there are two authors and they're both um psychologists right one of them is seems to be a specialist in cbt um cognitive behavioral behavioral therapy okay and um, yeah, so they, they talk about how anxiety and depression are very high. They talk about how um, partly it's because this generation was the first generation where their parents were so scared. Um, although crime went down so much in the 70s and 80s, their parents seemed to think they couldn't let them go outside and play as much. So they kept them inside. And there's a direct correlation between playing outside without supervision and being more t- thick skinned, if you like. Um, right. And all of these things, even even when it, to the level, uh, good analogies actually with allergy, uh, good analogies with allergies. Okay, so like peanut allergies, um, there was a study done where they took two groups of, uh, I think infants. Yeah, half of yeah. them they give them like exposure to peanuts. They feed them peanuts now and then. The other they completely don't give them any peanuts ever. And the group that never got peanuts had like several hundred percent chance. I think. Um, higher of getting a peanut allergy and the same kind of goes for letting your kids be exposed to some level of danger and getting you know used to these things yeah. um, and so what's happened is they they're now entering university uh they they specifically found a difference in behavior on university campuses from 2013 onwards yeah and that's exactly when this new generation was started to enter university and you find they're coming on campuses and they're just they they have a lot of mental health issues they um they they're considering speech to be violence they're very defensive they're very left leaning they also talk about the imbalance in universities between right leaning and left leaning professors like it, especially in the humanities it's very 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 left leaning so there's no balance there's no uh understanding of difference of opinion or the nuances so it's very very interesting bro i don't know how much it it kind of uh, applies to the UK or even other countries further east but is very interesting from a psychological point of view hmm there's a lot of um, 
there's a lot of things that we gloss over that actually have such a wide reaching effect on people based on little decisions that we make as parents or as societies mm. I mean it'll be interesting to see how um, you know like my my son's generation will <laughs> be when I mean my theory is that oh it won't be my assumption is that it won't be that vastly different to how life is now mm. but I bet it's just going to be completely different <laughs> and I'm going to be one of those dads that's just like what the hell is going on <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean we are kind of a generation though that grew up with uh, change happening very quickly and so yeah. I think what that means is we learnt to learn things quickly right if you see what I mean so like mm. so like uh, our parents generation things were changing slower than, than they were in our generation so they didn't actually need to learn to learn things as quickly as we do whereas us it's like that's one thing I think we kind of got used to is you know Facebook whatever changes its interface overnight and it was like we just adapt oh iOS but came out okay yeah, I'm yeah. Working out. you see like we grew up with that you know yeah 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 I can't get too attached but what what do you th- what are your thoughts on this whole coddling thing when it comes to you know raising your kid or kids like yeah do you think you're overprotecting do you think you're doing all right um you know it's it's funny you say that it's a difficult one for me because um although uh so i'm always of the notion that you know if my kid trips over or you know, hurts himself or whatever i don't like rushing to him at all in fact i tend to just i'd acknowledge maybe that he's hurt himself but i'm not going to run over and, and pre- pretend like it's the end of the world mm. um he's at that age now where if he hurts himself he will come over to me so like what did he mm. do earlier? He like slapped, he slapped my phone out of my hand, which is quite mm. ironic because I shouldn't, mm. you know, should be giving him attention. Yeah, yeah. But he slapped my phone out of my hand, and then he started sort of pretend crying that he hurt his hand. Oh. Uh, and I was like, "Well, you flipping hit, you smacked the phone, like, yeah. <laughs> do you, know what I mean? you deserve um, it." <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, like, because I'm exposed to more of the, you know, the the dark side of society mm. i get i sometimes do have this warped image of my of what what life is like out there mm. um and maybe i think you know touching on what we spoke about last episode i think that's what uh has made me very uh reclusive like i don't like going out on my days off i like to be at home i like to be with my family and i think the moment I step foot outside of the house, that's when I'm. I, I associate the outside world with work. Mm, um, right. Do you know what I mean? Like it's it's almost like okay. Imagine you you worked at I don't know a university or mm. or some sort of establishment that teaches because you were teaching before mm. and you had to go there on your day off or something. Yeah. Fair enough. Do you know what I mean? But mm. you wouldn't want to do that, and you'd feel like uncomfortable being there. It's yeah. like that for me. It's like uh, the city is my playground, and for you, the city is my office. <laughs> it's, yeah, exactly. And I, I hate, and I think that is probably why I never, like, I, I, I socialize in London now. I go to London because it's so far away. It's mm. a different environment. I can switch off over there. I can't switch off if I go out here. Mm. Um, some of the, Musa, Musa Adnan and, and another brother came down yesterday to Brighton to see me, and I went out with them. God forbid, I never really go out in Brighton. Mm. But I can't. I couldn't even concentrate because I'm like, oh, I'm going to bump into this person. Oh, I know that person over there. Or, do you know what I mean? It's mm. just, it's just not. It's not a nice experience anymore. Mm. Um, so, as far as uh, your original question, yeah, it, it's. I can't help but. I don't know. Like on one on one level, like I see the realities of what some people fear as. Um, could happen based on like I don't know fear mongering of media and news and stuff they might mm. uh, raise the threat of something really high mm. like say oh this you know you're going to go out there and you're going to get raped do you know what I mean something extreme yeah. um, based on what they see on the news and stuff mm. uh, on the other hand it's knowing the reality of these people exist and they're not always the stereotypes that you might consider mm. do you know what I mean there's people that are everyday people that you wouldn't even know um people that are professionals that you wouldn't even know that are just 
awful people. Mm. Um, so it's a bit of a catch twenty two. Can you give uh, like uh, juicy examples? Like, is there an example of somebody you'd never expect to be doing X Y Z, but they're doing X Y Z? Um, I mean, like, okay, if we were to talk about like paedophiles, for example, mm. I mean, there's lots of paedophiles in professional positions, you know. Mm. Uh, it's just you know, you just be surprised, man. You'd be surprised. There's crazy stuff. There's like doctors that like have slaves almost at home. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like slave labor at home, modern yeah. slavery. Mm. Um, there's like trying to think what else but like basically there's this there's there's a lot of people that you just wouldn't know like people that are everyday people but yeah. they just have i don't know weird twisted dark secrets or mm. weird interests and fetishes and stuff like that do you know what mm. i mean um and it's really difficult when you come from a a culture that has very or a religion that you know sets very clear boundaries and things like things you wouldn't even think of that wouldn't even cross your mind. Those are people's lives. Mm. Do you know what I mean? People live in a certain way that is just completely foreign to the way we live and the things we value. Mm. Um, you know, even the thing that's that put barriers on that sort of stuff for us, not only is it the dean and the culture, but it's also just having family around you and having this sort of notion of family and accountability towards family. Mm. A lot of these people, bro, they just have no family whatsoever, no religion no culture no way of life that they're literally just animals at home like they do what they want at home they live that whatever life they want to li uh, live they fulfill whatever desire they want to fulfill do you know what i mean yeah. there's no limit yeah. there's no boundaries to what where the where mm. shaitan will take them yeah you know and that's what that's the biggest thing that mm. we have to be aware of like i think we our assumption is that you know a majority of people are decent people and you know allahu alam maybe they are but a lot of people have zero boundaries whatsoever mm. because boundaries to them, th th like there comes a time in some people's lives where putting boundaries on themselves doesn't make sense because it because yeah. all of it looks like a, a social construct to them. It's all mm, a social construct. Yeah. Why should I? What? Why? This boundary doesn't actually make sense. If I'm not hurting anybody, then I can do what I want. You know? Yeah, you but, can find ways to justify most things, isn't it? Definitely. Like even if. Even if society views that thing as wrong, you yeah. can find ways to justify it, even to yourself secretly. Definitely, isn't it? bro. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and those voices collectively get louder on the internet, you know, when mm. you go on Reddit or you go on particular forums or whatever, people sort of band together and they find like-minded individuals. And that's what sort of um, substantiates their, mm. their emotions it and their drives and stuff. Them. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, it's like yeah, this book. Uh, I'm probably I'm looking to read. It, it's I think it's about um, the the what seems to be the main reason for depression, which is actually uh, like relationships or lack of relationships or lack of good relationships, right? Mm. And I think a lot of like getting messed up in the head or getting uh, mentally ill or all these kind of things. I think a lot of the time it comes from even social kind of unrest and, and breakdown of families it comes to, uh, it comes from a lack of structure okay in general mm. right so like you said these people maybe they live alone right that means they don't have the structure of having a spouse having kids having those responsibilities having parents that they you know they at least check up on now and then um yeah all these things create structure which is actually absolutely essential for humans including and this is why one of the biggest reasons I, I find gender roles to be a very important topic to, for us to get clarity on uh, is because gender roles create structure. And it just yeah. allows you to know, like, this is my role in life. This is my purpose. And there are many roles we play. There is, for example, as a man, you're going to be a son. You're going to be a brother. You're going to be a, a husband and a father and, a, a, you know, an employee maybe. And these are all roles that if you know the roles, you know the boundaries you're playing within. Yeah. And it really helps you, I think, mentally. It's, I think, you know, the more I, the more I live, mm. the more I realize, like, it's it's the wise non-Muslims that tend to realize that, like you mentioned in that big book review, they end up going full circle in a way and admitting that actually without any submission to a higher being or a higher thing or higher idea, then we are lost as individuals. Like, and, and, 
it's so true in the sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Quran that the only reason that we were created is to worship him. Right? Like if that is innate, if that is biologically in us, like it's almost like I don't know, a pair of scissors, bro. A pair of scissors is only good for cutting things. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Like that's what it's designed for, and that's why it does it perfectly. Mm. You know, and it, you you try and do anything else with a yeah. pair of scissors, and it's not going to do a great job. Yeah. But you you use that pair of scissors for what it was designed mm. for, then it will do a great job. It will do a perfect job. And essentially, mm. if we look at ourselves as like a tool or something yeah. that basic, like if we if we were to water down a human being into the core essence of what it is. A, mm. a a creature that was made to worship its lord right to submit to its lord then yeah. that's why submission makes sense it aligns everything like the moment one you know submits himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or in their eyes to something greater than themselves then the stars start to align so to speak mm. things start making sense P- people start calming down people achieve levels of, of of consciousness that they wouldn't have had before of self reflection they wouldn't have had before um, yeah, but like I said, if you've got no limits, no boundaries, it's just pure chaos. It's like a wildfire. Yes, you can't contain it, mm. and it just ends up destroying mm. the the very mm. ground that it walks on. And as as smart as we think we are, we actually can't deal with that. We we can't mm, deal definitely. with a complete lack of boundaries. Or what what it, what what is a lack of boundaries? It's freedom. Yeah, like exactly. Like we actually really struggle with freedom, which makes it very puzzling to set that as the highest goal in your life to get as much freedom as possible. Um, I really like your your scissors analogy because it's like, okay, scissors cut really well, but if you yeah. try and use scissors as a hammer, uh, yeah. then maybe you could force it to actually act as a hammer, but it might break. It might exactly. not do a good job. Exactly. And and if the scissors had, had a conscious and had a... a a, a soul if you like i'm sure its self-esteem would be hurt by being used as a hammer because like i suck at this you know yeah. and yeah. This, you can apply that to so much it's like now uh many societies are trying to change scissors into hammers and into nails and this and that and it's like yeah for the sake of freedom and exploring different things you can be right but ultimately your scissors and you should be cutting and trying to cut the best you can exactly but, but they're experimenting with being all these other things yeah and you know the the biggest obstacle in a lot of it is you know we'll say it again and again is the ego the ego that that mm. gets in the way of saying oh i i should submit to a higher power mm. like i remember stephen fry as an example as educated as he is as well spoken as he is he said some incredibly blasphemous things about the idea of god and saying and such shallow things that you would assume someone like him would probably read deeper into and understand yeah. the the concepts of but straight away as far as i can remember he he, he was just appalled at the idea that god would allow such bad things to happen and yeah and who does god think he is and all this mm. other stuff do you know what I mean? Yeah. Which is just like the height of arrogance and ego. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. But he, you know, I'm sure, Allahu Alam, I'm sure his mental state is probably going through all sorts of stuff that he can't control, you know, because yeah. a lot of people's mental state do. I'm not saying that based on facts. I'm just saying that through guesswork. Mm. Um, but the reality, these these sorts of people with these sorts of ideas and make that make these grand statements. Um, and, and to think that the people that maybe do have it a little bit more collected and a bit karma and can sort of understand their own mind are the people that say well actually i am not in control um mm. being in complete control isn't actually destined for me it's not something that i can achieve you have to relinquish um control to something beyond you at a certain point you know yeah that's why you know like you said as smart as stephen fry seems to be uh he's actually dumb right the reason he's mm. dumb is because his heart is not able to think, right? And yeah. Allah says that. Allah says, لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا They mm. have hearts that they don't think with. Mm. That's crazy. The heart that they don't think with, that shows that thinking is brain and heart. Mm. 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 And the people of the dunya, especially successful people in the dunya, they their their brains are good for thinking, seem to be good for thinking, but their hearts are kind of lacking, you know? Yeah. So yeah. may Allah give us very smart hearts. 
<laughs> <laughs> I wonder if it's something to do with um, the arrogance of, of intellect. Uh, because, you know, I follow a Reddit page on well, on Reddit. That's, mm. It's it's r slash I am very smart or something like this. Okay. And, it, and it's it's just examples of people that say really sort of snarky things to make themselves appear super smart. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like okay. replying, like so maybe someone co- replying in a comment. Well, actually, you know, I have an IQ of such and such and such, <laughs> yeah, okay. and I can tell you that you know what I mean you're wrong because of this and this and this. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like people that are just completely oblivious to how stupid they sound, but. <laughs> Because they truly believe that they're, you know, super smart, then they get super arrogant about it. But, mm. but this is it. Like, it's 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 actually quite interesting. It shows you the difference between intelligence and wisdom, because um, it's not always easy to decipher. You'd assume both are the same, uh, but intelligence is is always going to be. It's the information, and then like wisdom is like how you share it, or why, when you share it, or why you share it, mm-hmm. or if you share it at all. You know, mm. it's the application of that 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 wisdom is, um, and intelligence is often blinding. Intelligence is often something uh, that can get in the way, and I think with a lot of people, this is why I believe like a lot of, I say a lot of Muslims, but some Muslims they you know they they get certain level of education, certain level of academia in them and then they struggle with their religion because they they can't they give them their own mind and what they've learned a bit too much importance Mm -hmm. uh that they can't they can't make gaps not can't make gaps but they can't they feel like they're able to learn it all and because it's not adding up to them in their head then there's no room for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's no room for the deen yeah um because they believe that because they're learning so much about the dunya uh, and you know everything's adding up but nothing is mm. directly pointing towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala existing in a sense that you can write it on a piece of paper and observe it then they're like well there's mm. nothing you know what I mean there's nothing yeah. proving that for them yeah this is the difficulty of our times I think because yeah you know yeah and he compared to previous peoples from what we know like we're doing well in, in materially, you know, we're doing well yeah. and we've made many advancements and the advancements seem to be speeding up. Right. Um, yeah. But that's the problem, bro, is like without humility, you can't actually believe. And even if you believe on your tongue, it's actually difficult for your heart to be in submission when deep down you kind of, I don't know, you kind of feel like, no, I did this. No, I deserve that. No. I'm sick, whatever, you know, it, yeah. that's why you need to be humbled sometimes. This is why, you know, Yanni, uh, this is what I've read before. Like sometimes Allah will test people with something like um, an earthquake. It's like mm. it's reminding you how completely uh, and utterly out of control you are. And it humbles you, isn't it? It's like, oh, like, like it's, uh, for example, perfect example is uh, Qawm Ahad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was uh the Prophet uh, Saleh, he, right? He was sent to add. Was it Saleh? I believe so. Or is that. No. Um, um, yes. Damn. I believe so. Anyway. Am I wrong? Alayhi salam, whichever one it was. I think it was Saleh. Anyway, um, so Qawm Ahad, yeah? They, Allah gave them, man, yani, mashallah. They were, they were making very fancy houses, gardens, all of that. Like, amazing. Um, now the thing is, they 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 had it so sick that they obviously they got arrogant. They thought that they had kind of, I don't know. It's like a natural thing that came to them. I don't know that when you're living real good, some for some reason you feel like you did it. I don't know why that happens really, but they felt they did it all. But then Allah, uh, you know, destroyed them. You know, yeah. and when you when you see that, it's just like. Uh, I mean, these stories in the Quran for us to kind of think about, isn't it? And ponder. And when you see the comforts they were living in, and then you see yourself living in comforts, you're supposed to connect the dots, right? And you're supposed to say, okay, if I start to ever think that, because I don't remember the ayat off the top of my head, but it's like it, it indicates that they actually felt like they were independent of Allah. Like the gardens they had and the huge houses and the yeah, amazing exactly, thing. Yeah. They, the, the ayat indicate that 
they they thought they didn't need Allah for this and they actually had done it all themselves. So if, if you find yourself going down that path and that way of thinking, then either you need to humble yourself or like if you're lucky, Allah will humble you, right? Because if you're yeah. not lucky, you go full ghafla mode and then yani, Allah will musta'an. Uh, it was Prophet Hud. Hud, Hud went to Ad, yeah? Hud went to Ad. Okay. Was Salih, was, Salih. Uh, Salih was the Thamud. one that went to the, with the camel, isn't it? Yeah, and Thamud. Who Naqa, the, sort yeah. Of. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's interesting, bro. I think I find it insane because... <laughs> okay, let's take a, a slice of it, of culture. Hmm. Um, let's look at modern day rap, hip hop, that kind of culture, hmm. or anything in general, or any sort of mainstream music, or yeah, yeah. mainstream music is is what people consume. Probably they probably consume more music than they do movies and stuff. Yeah. Um, and that a lot of that mainstream music is is this is pure unadulterated arrogance being pumped into your ears yeah making you feel a certain type of way yeah. uh feel a certain type of entitlement the fact that uh we soundtrack our experiences and soundtrack our lives itself does wonders for arrogance because it's essentially and i say it time and time again but it's just a phenomenon that fascinates me is plugging your headphones in and making yourself the main character of a movie by having a soundtrack playing for yourself you know <laughs> You f you feel like you are you know, the most important person walking down that street at that time yeah. because the soundtrack is playing for you. Mm. It's playing your beat. It's you know the the camera, the lights of the camera, and everyone's looking at you. Mm. Um, that's what it is. It main character. I, I, I wish there was a uh, <laughs> a term for it, but I'm coining it. It, you, it main characterizes you. Like yeah. it makes you the protagonist of this story. Yeah. Um, but the moment you unplug those headphones, you suddenly just fade into the background and you're an extra mm. on the set, you know? Um, mm. So, yeah, this this notion, and, and oh, I find it insane because to think how oblivious one can be, because I, I will, I will, I'll be the first to say that, you know, when I wasn't practicing, when I listened to music or whatever, I was of the belief that that personality trait was something positive, you know? To be so self-confident to the mm. point where... There's almost there's almost like a level of arrogance to yourself. Mm. Um, was like a, a a pro. It's what people should have, like confidence mm. in the sense mm. that you know they can I don't know achieve anything and beat anyone and whatever. Mm. Um, and but the thing is, bro, back. like, go on. If you if you're taking a rap as an example, yeah, honestly, bro, rap is the place you find the least confidence, right? Be, for me, this is what I always read into it. Yeah, that. These guys are so insecure that they must project that they're secure. They almost, it's like, they're, it's like when they're rapping, they're trying to convince themselves that they are worth something. And yeah. that, that's what I actually think is happening. That, and a lot of these people, they, they grew up in such uh, circumstances that they probably were told that you're worthless, whether it's from teachers, parents, whatever it is, yeah? yeah. And so they spend their whole careers rapping trying to convince themselves that they're worth something so yeah. i think rap is a place where it's all fake confidence it's it and arrogance is the actual polar opposite of confidence that's how i see it so you have like a spectrum one side is arrogance one side is confidence it's not like uh arrogance is an extreme of confidence i actually think it's the complete opposite somebody confident they're very calm they're very grounded and they also uh, uh, i don't know how you could be confident without knowledge of allah right but um, a confident muslim is someone that they're so confident and they kind of they know the confidence the source of the confidence is from allah so it's almost the opposite of arrogance like you're like i didn't do none of this like yeah. i'm amazing at xyz alhamdulillah i'm i'm aware that i'm definitely above average in xyz but i'm also very aware that it's because of allah you know of course so it's like the absolute opposite of arrogance so definitely like um confidence i would say more somebody you know like jordan peterson that is somebody you see if you see the way he carries himself in on tv for example it that is very confident because yeah. when he's being attacked so harshly sometimes he's keeping it cool right he's keeping it cool he's answering he's very collected and for me that sends the subconscious message that 
yeah, yeah, I like, I'm going to get to you. Like, don't worry, I've got my answers. I'm, I know what I'm talking yeah. about here. I'm the expert here, right? Yeah. Whereas if you take somebody with the confidence of these rappers and put them in that situation, they well, they probably stand up, start throwing stuff everywhere. <laughs> So, it's difficult, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, like you could, it could be anything. It could be someone training for a competition for years, and they'll win that competition, and they'll, they'll, the first thing they'll do is just congratulate themselves, and because of me and my hard work, I got here. <laughs> and then you will have someone else who will, you know, win that competition, and be, he'll say, "Glory be to Allah who allowed me to mm. to, to succeed in this." You know, yeah. completely negating, mm. completely negating like the hard work it took there, and mm. you know. I think for us, like, for example, I'm sure me and you, I mean, our first thought, like, we could be revising for an exam or something. Mm. I know I've done it. Bare times. Revise for an exam. Um, stress about it. Put all, all the hard work. But then when we do the exam mm. and we get a good result, first thing we say is, alhamdulillah, we're not even thinking about the hard work we put in to get there. Mm. Like, it takes a while. I don't even think I even think like that anymore. Think like, oh, because of the work I did, mm. this is why I got that result. Like, everything... It gets to a point where you you relinquish so much to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala mm. that you put in the work, sort of like on autopilot because you're not even thinking about the equation. You're still yeah. making dua all the whole way through, yeah, <laughs> because it's it's in Allah's sort of uh, control, isn't it? Yeah, bro. I'm I'm actually reminded of this this area, and it shows it's it's actually proof that the people of Jannah are humble people, okay? Because in Surah Al Araf, I just pulled it up. Surah Al-A'raf, uh, Allah is talking about the people of Jannah. He says, وَنَزَعْنَا مَا فِي صُدُورِهِمْ مِنْ غِلٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهِمُ الْأَنْهَارِ yeah? well, We've removed uh, from their uh, chest, uh, I don't know what ghil is, but I guess it's uh, any stress, I think. تَجْرِي, so the, the rivers are flowing under them. وَقَالُوا, what do they say, the people of Jannah? They say, وَقَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ Alhamdulillah, Aladi Hadana Lihada, that Allah guided us to this. Wama kunna lanah tadi, and it, we, it, we weren't able, we wouldn't be guided, Lola and Hadana Allah, unless Allah guided us. So, so the people of Jannah are, are so humble, they're going into Jannah, they're not saying, Yes, sick boy. <laughs> they're not even saying that. They say, Alhamdulillah. And they say, and then they say, Allah did this, and then they say, Yeah, no way would we be here unless Allah guided us, you know. And then, uh, actually, interestingly, I'm kind of uh, commenting on this freestyle, yeah. Um, interestingly, after that, they say, "Laqad jaat rusulu Rabbina bil haq," and then they 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 now they praised Allah. Now they're praising the prophets. Actually, um, the the they say the the. The messengers came to us, the, the messages of Allah. So they, they link the messages back to Allah. The message of Allah came to us with the truth. Wanudu and antilkumul jannah, jannah to urath to muha, bima kuntum ta'amalun. Yeah. So, hum humility, in it, to enter jannah. Humility. And this, this, we were talking about in the last episode that uh, I was saying that the, this year that I was doing the teaching and all of that. It was the hardest time and it was the time of most closest to Allah. And that's because it yeah. was the time of most being humbled, like being overwhelmed every day by something quite simple, quite yeah. every day. Like, like there are tens of thousands of teachers just in the UK or whatever. Yeah. And here's me like being overwhelmed going there. Right. And there are many, yeah. there are many like logical reasons why, okay, yeah, no, I should actually feel like this. That's fine. Right. That's fine. But the, the benefit of just being humble day after day like damn i suck at this like right now at least i, I i'm not yeah. holding things i'm not holding it together fully and that yeah. that being humble the only well it's like it's almost like spiritual medicine true i mean people as man can really go through the roof when they're going through a very hard time yeah no other doubt. people some people some people go the opposite yeah way. that's true but that, that's really why it's a, start sinning more and stuff. But but that's why even the direction you take when you're humbled, you have got to thank Allah for it if you go the right way, isn't it? Yeah, Alhamdulillah. That that's alhamdulillah. the that's the madness. And yani, as Allah says in multiple places, like it's not that Allah is testing you, and you could go down one of two ways, and then Allah's actually going to nudge you down the bad way. <laughs> There's no yeah. way that Allah is always the one to nudge you in the good direction. If you like force it. Then you need free will. Allah will let you go down that way. But of course. Like it's almost like 
you're walking on the earth and it's tilted. You know, have you ever done that in a, I don't know, maybe some kind of theme parks or something like this, where it's like the ground is tilted and you're trying to walk straight, but it's tilted. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's like, you know, when they stop someone who's been drinking, they like, walk on the straight line. Yeah. So <laughs> like, it's like Allah's setting you up. So you're like walking, you think you're walking straight, but you're actually going towards the truth. Yeah. You're on an angle. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. It'd be interesting, you know. I mean, it's just a, it's an interesting concept to wonder how many times Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has sort of uh, put signs in front of people. I'd, I'd be really, it's one of those sort of mystery questions. I'd really want to see some non-Muslims' life from start to finish and just see what kind of signs of guidance they had in front of them. Mm. You know? Yeah. Um, I mean, even us, like, bro. Even us. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. Allah, you know, uh, it's it's. That's one thing. Like, if if you're if you're a Muslim and you're arrogant, um, and you were like born into a Muslim family and all this stuff, like you could have been anywhere in the world, you could have had any sort of life, um, you could have been, you know, what was that news story the other day? Thirty nine people dead in the back of a lorry. Mm. You could have been one of those people. You know what I mean? Like anything, anything. Yeah. Yeah. You you could. Oh, it's insane. It's insane. Like, I'm mm. not saying that this this life's a lottery and you just get a random one but in a sense like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have made your life any one of these other people's lives yeah um, <laughs> bro Ga- Gary V cracks me up yeah he's like yeah he's like he's trying to like teach people to be grateful and, and more positive and, and stuff yeah and he's like you could have been a tree <laughs> <laughs> You could have been a tree. I mean, I couldn't have been a tree, man. Like, I could, I, I get your point, but no, I couldn't have been a tree. In, a, in another one, he's like, you could have been a bus. <laughs> so much, bro. There's so much. Like, even time zones. Like, time. I was watching um, a short little documentary about overpopulation and mm. whether it's like the fear is legit or not. And it was just talking about how. The, the way population growth is now is all standard. It's just a reaction to what happened before. Mm. Um, people had more kids before because le- kids were less likely to survive. Mm. Um, and then with better medicine, more kids survived. So people started having less kids because there wasn't a need to have loads of kids. And then it just sort of balances yeah. itself out, you know. Um, but yeah, it just made me think because they, they were saying, like, obviously a, a few hundred years ago in the UK, like the average amount of kids people would have was like five or six um mm. but only a, a couple of them would make it th- through to adulthood yeah. um and just the thought <clears throat> of that being an accepted fact is insane to me yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. imagine yeah. you having five kids and knowing that at least three of them won't make it to adulthood mm. like because that's just the way it goes yeah it's just crazy bro and there's you know there's places like that now yes. but we we fail to ponder over what life we could have been given and what what reality we could be faced with yeah you know? yeah and you always got to tread that that a gray line or whatever uh, in terms of being grateful for the position yeah. you're in but then yeah. also knowing that but i'm always thinking in the back of my head like oh man i'm at a disadvantage when it comes to jannah like i'm not poor yeah. i'm not like losing kids i'm not I got these i've not got that so it's always like the thing but yeah. Yeah, and it, there are many, many great people who it's, are rich and they use different you know, things. And It makes me think of like the analogy of like a, a candle that just needs to keep burning. Hmm. Because if you, the moment you stop thinking, the moment you stop bouncing, that oxygen sort of flows, mm-hmm. the, the candle goes out and you never progress. And, and what you've just said made me think because you're always, you're always stuck between hope and fear. Like, I hope that my life could get better right mm-hmm. i hope things can improve for my situation like I, like what i mentioned in last episode you know i opened mm-hmm. up quite a bit about some of the struggles i'm facing yeah i could i could say yeah i hope things get better i hope i work things out i hope i make my life better better and whatever but at the same time there's an element of selfishness in that because i will say well actually i'm being a little bit selfish in the sense that there's people that are going through much worse and i should be grateful for what i've got and i should be grateful for the position i'm in right now Mm, you know and it's those thoughts that keep going back and forth it's providing Mm. the oxygen for that flame of Mm, self-reflection without that if i was either thinking one or the other then that flame would go out yeah and there would you know i mean if i if i said if i um didn't seek to make my situation better and just accepted accepted everything then there would never be any progress you know 
there would never be any sort of tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the sense that I can aim high and have ulul himma and improve the situation for the ummah, improve the situation for myself, you know, take up the, the tools that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me with. Um, but on the other hand, if I was to just always be complaining and always be ungrateful and always be selfish, mm. then I wouldn't have any gratitude whatsoever. Yeah. So there's a time for this and there's a time for that. And mm. I think that's, I think that's something I've realized is that I've always had it in my mind that I have to be either one or the other. Like I'm always, I'm either going to have to be completely unhappy with what I have and go a hundred miles an hour into trying to improve my situation or mm. I have to be content and not and just accept the way life is. And I've always had that battle, not realizing that that battle needs to carry on for the rest of my life. You have <laughs> yeah. to be living in between hope and fear all yeah. the time, sincerely, yeah, you know? What's the difference, though, between the people that are driven nuts by that and the people who are, like, pretty comfortable with just switching between these two ways of thinking? Because I think as a man, you aren't... You, as a man who's responsible for others or anyone who's responsible for others you're not you are not isolated in your decisions like your i think this is the important thing about men your decisions and the your mindset directly affects and ripples so many other people it depends what position mm-hmm. you're in you know if you were a man that was isolated that had no family had nothing no one to answer for then yeah theoretically maybe you could uh live a life of complete contentment and not worry as long as you're okay as long as you're happy to be content, then you can live a life of pure contentment without ever improving your situation or aiming high, you know. Mm. But mm. our deen teaches to do things to the best of our ability. Um, mm-hmm. And when we do things to the best of our ability, then there's always room for improvement. There's always... Um, there's always ladders to climb. There's always other people's hearts that we can affect. There's always more expansion that can be done. There's always, uh, you know, if you if you were to say, if you were to say, I mean, as an individual, mm. you are responsible for your wife, uh, your extended family, whoever you're basically responsible over, you know, mm. uh, that means that you have to execute that responsibility in the best way possible. Yeah. But then you start seeing flaws that need improving, which mm-hmm. could be improved if you started investing in yourself, focusing in yourself, improving your financial situation, improving your spiritual situation, you know? Yeah. Without identifying these deficiencies we have, yeah, you could be content with your deficiencies. You could be content with the dunya. Mm. But at the same time, you could say, okay, well, I need dunya to go to hajj. I need dunya to send my children to a particular school or to educate them. Or I need, do you understand? Like, there's always going to be things that you could use uh, in terms of investing in yourself that will actually benefit your akhirah. Yeah. How do we even pay charity and zakat and stuff without even investing in the dunya? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, a, a poor person could say, a poor person, a poor poor person, miskin, that doesn't, that doesn't even, is not even eligible for zakat, right? Mm. They could, they could theoretically live their life. Imagine this, a, a pious, really pious a uh, miskeen poor person live their whole life content with the situation they've been put in and they could do something mm. as simple as look at someone else putting charity mm. in a bucket and mm-hmm. think subhanallah I'm being I feel like I'm being um, not forbidden but like I'm missing out on that opportunity I wish I could give charity as well and that could be yeah. their driving factor that could be yeah. like oh, okay you know what I want to give charity as well mm. I want to get to a stage where I can start helping people and give charity mm. you know and, and mm. this is what I mean Hmm. It's always there's always something there's always hmm. something. Hmm. You know, I don't know how uh, how relevant this is, but I just, I just want to share it anyway because I really found it very fascinating. So, you know, if we talk about or we think about ambition as a woman, yeah, women having yeah. ambition. A lot of women have ambition. You know, especially in certain societies, they wanna you want to be a boss lady. <laughs> they wanna uh, have a career. They wanna. Yeah, and he be a super mom or these things, yeah. Um, I came across this story, very interesting story about, uh, and it shows what the female companions, what their ambitions were, yeah. Yeah. So um, it was actually Um Salam, I believe. She came to the Prophet Sallam. She said, like, how is it that we don't get, uh, we don't get to fight jihad like the men do? And we don't get, uh, we get half of the inheritance that men get. Yeah? yeah. So like she wanted to 
her ambition was to fight. Like she wanted Shahada. Yeah. She had, yeah. The, the wording is actually that they get to fight. So how like we can't fight and we can't die. She said we can't die. We can't be killed. Yeah. And what what was the response to this? Allah re- revealed the ayah. Don't uh, don't wish for what other people have been given. For for yeah. women they get what they work for, and men they get what they work for. Yeah. Wa salu Allah and fadli and ask Allah from His bounty. So. Mm-hmm. Um, Somehow that was connected to what you were just saying. Um, you talk about ambition and, and, and like the balance yeah, between it's about being grateful rationalizing, and ambition. Rationalizing yeah. it sometimes. Yeah, yeah. It? So I just, um, I've been coming across a lot of these stories and it's very interesting. You know, like when you, when you listen to speakers, it's always interpretation. As much yeah. as you hope and you would like to think that they're giving you the pure Quran and Sunnah. Just the fact that it's being translated into English means that there's interpretation in it, okay? Yeah. And so it's very eye-opening when you go as direct to the source as possible, you know? Mm. And in this case, I mean, assuming what I just narrated, Yanni, is, is sahih, um, that, that's pretty direct, isn't it? It's, it's the exact words of Um Salama, and then it's, it's the exact ayah that Allah revealed. So um, this stuff is very eye-opening, bro, and it's like... Bro, some of the stuff I've been reading, it's like, trust me, no speaker can even share this stuff. Like, it would yeah. be too controversial sometimes. But you're, yeah. but if you don't, if you don't go and go to the primary sources yourself, you're always going to be locked out of the the unaltered truth, if you like. Not that they're changing the truth, but they've got to adapt it. But it would be cool for you to consume it, and then you kind of. I don't know, bro. Just the pureness, bro. Yeah, is is Definitely. fascinating, uh, bro. Do we? Um, do you have time to deal with questions? Let's just deal with some questions if we can. Um, I wanted to, but the, my son's got a bath bomb. He wants to show me. <laughs> <laughs> they've got they've got a bath running, and the bath bombs in the, in this room. And he, he, I think in basically... the room that you're in now. Yeah. Oh, so I'm it's not very loud. <laughs> He's like shouting at the door because he wants to come in. Bro, you know the um, eighteen-day-old one. Is that a question or not? Oh, uh, it is, but it's a very long one. Let me see. But will the answer be long? What do you think? Uh, uh, oh, he's starting to scream. Um, you know what? Actually, we're gonna have to do it next. We're gonna have to do it next episode. Inshallah. Okay. No problem. Inshallah. Um, we're recording a little bit late today, guys, because of uh, crazy schedules. Obviously, you can imagine that means got to put up with my schedule. Um, I mean, it's been another lovely episode. So natural, so free flowing, yeah. so deep. You know? <laughs> but we're, we're not late, though, bro. No. Well, no. I meant like we're recording late. In late at night. Usually we record. Mm. Yeah. Usually yeah. we record at, in the morning, mm. but recording in the evening today. Mm. Um, anywho, uh, thank you guys for following us on my dice i think we hit 500 followers on instagram today okay i say that we're probably gonna like lose one and it's gonna really irritate me <laughs> oh 501 oh, that's what i like to see <laughs> nice um yeah we're getting a, some nice nice uh feedbacks nice feedback and stuff uh questions are coming in again uh all sorts of all sorts of stuff man um get Visit us on mindheist.com, mindheistpodcast.com even, mm-hmm. uh, for your go-to area for all things Mind Heist in terms of questions, listening to episodes on the browser, if that's what takes your fancy. Um, Emailing emails, us, whatever. Instagram yeah. link. It, everything, bro, everything you can imagine mm. that is Mind Heist worthy. Mm-hmm. Uh, once again, we're opening up for sponsors and and. and anyone who wants to sort of advertise their business or their their projects or whatever you can send us an email through that link as well um if you want to get in touch with us uh see what we're doing privately i know i mean are you still updating serial masters i ask you this every episode I uh youtube you see yeah so well, yeah you just doing... saw the new video so yeah uh, i've yeah. got i got like uh i've got at least one more video in the in the kind of ready to go for next week so definitely there'll yeah. be one day yeah Let's check out Sierra masters on, on youtube uh, that's i mean's little baby mm-hmm. um i'm on what am i on i'm on instagram aki tweet that's probably what i use the most mm-hmm. um 
yeah so thanks for listening once again this has been episode 52 of the mind heist podcast and we will catch you next time assalamu alaikum Assalamu alaikum subhanakallahum bihamdika shadu wa la ilaha anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayh By the way I just had to add that at the end because uh, it's like a kafaratul majlis it's like uh, it's asking Allah for forgiveness for any rubbish you spoke in the majlis <laughs> Okay bro I'm going to stop recording right now